and g'day everybody. It's Benjamin Morgan, uh, Chief Executive of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia. And today uh, we're going to be catching up with Queensland Senator Malcolm Roberts. Now, uh, Senator Malcolm Roberts is from the uh, Pauline Hanson One Nation Party, uh, which is one of the independent parties that are currently vying for an opportunity to put members into parliament and senators into parliament. Uh, as part of our federal election. And today we've been given uh, some time to catch up with uh, Senator Roberts to discuss, I guess, some of the concerns that we have uh, for Australian aviation and I guess some of our top priorities. And so the format for today's conversation is a, a casual catch up. It's a kind of under the bonnet um, look at how advocacy takes place in which organisations like the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association will engage with elected officials, raise the issues, discuss through them our concerns, and I guess elevate them to a point where they're on the table. Now, no doubt in today's conversation, we're going to gain some insights, not only in terms of what the One Nation Party would do on some of these issues or what its thoughts might be, but also with respect to Senator Roberts, uh, who himself is vying for election. So I'm going to bring uh, Senator Roberts right in at this point in time. Welcome, Queensland Senator Malcolm Roberts, to our broadcast today. Thank you very much, Ben, for having me. And, and by the way, I'm not up for election because... I'm, uh, I was elected in 2019, so I have six years to go until 2025. Fantastic. Well, you know what? That That's even better for today's conversation. Then I've got uh, even more confidence in knowing that some of this stuff we can definitely get elevated with you. Uh, but thank you very much for agreeing to meet with us. And I think it's really important for organisations like ours uh, as we move through uh, this federal election to have the opportunity to speak with representatives of the various parties and to gain a bit of an insight into their thinking, uh, but also for you to gain an insight into our thinking as an advocate on behalf of Australian aviation. And I guess um, maybe to start with a bit of a, a background of AOPA. So the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia is a member-based organisation. We're not funded by any state or federal uh, government um, grants or, or funding. We're a completely independent organisation and we were formed in 1949 specifically by a group of aviators coming together with the common goal to foster uh, the development of general aviation uh, in Australia. And General Aviation Senator, uh, when we discuss this, uh, relates to small to medium size aviation, private aviators, recreational aviators, sport aviators, uh, people who are flying for fun, flying for recreation or flying privately, people who fly privately for business. So you might have a business person who owns a small single engine aeroplane and uses that to get out and about right across Australia and understanding, especially in your state, the state of Queensland, there are some great distances to be covered by people who need to get out and about. So general aviation represents this small to medium size bracket uh, and comprises of aircraft maintenance companies, flying schools, uh, charter businesses, people who hire aircraft and pilots to go from point to point, uh, along with a multitude of other businesses like aerial photography, aerial firefighting, um, survey work, mapping. Uh, all of this stuff is packaged up into this concept of general aviation. So uh, throughout today's discussion, when you hear me talk about general aviation, that's what I'm talking about. Um, in parallel to general aviation, we also have the airline industry, uh, which comprises of our RPT, our, our airline services that are feeding uh, passengers and cargo and freight in and out of regional and, and rural Australia, uh, guys like your regional expresses, your air links, uh, all the way up through your virgins and your Qantases and to the domestic and international operations. And they're what we typically would regard as the airline transport industry. And so that's the, the delineation. And sometimes we get a little bit confused because sometimes politicians seem to think, oh, aviation is just about airliners. And it's, it's not quite that way. Uh, because most of the airline industry, in fact, can't exist without this multitude and complex array of small general aviation businesses that we find right across the country. Well, and I, so, I know that I, I've, I've asked you to do most of the talking because I want to learn and listen. But I can tell you, I know about a little bit about general aviation because my son, who's now 28, got his pilot's license before he got his car, li car driver's license. So well, look, he fantastic. wanted to be in general aviation. So well, we is. need to connect with him and make him a member of AOPA Australia for certain <laughs> so we can look after his rights as well. He was actually very discouraged about uh, going into an airline um, because he, he can see the pressure that are now on pilots and he's he's got a number of concerns about the way the airlines are behaving and as a result of uh, the, some of the regulations and some of the other pressures that are coming onto people. So he's not in the aircraft industry anymore or the aviation industry anymore. But well, that's uh, a shame. We really do need people in. 
Yeah, well, we That's really right. do need people in. And so today's conversation, Senator, will focus on two specific topics. The first topic I'd like to start with is the impact on airport privatisation on our general aviation industry. Uh, and to try and keep it as short and succinct as I can, uh, when we talk about airport privatisation in Australia from about 1996 through about 1999, uh, the federal government um, enacted a process to privatise the federally owned and operated airports in this country. And so that airport... Was the Liberal to... National Government under John Howard and John Anderson. Yeah, I believe so. But I believe that the airport privatisation scheme was started under Labor, but it was actually carried and executed under uh, Liberal National. So they both have a responsibility here with the creation of this uh, framework. But what we ventured into as a, as a nation was for our capital city airports, our big international airports to be privatised. Then they privatised our uh, secondary general aviation airports, that's your Bankstowns, your, your Brisbane Archerfields, uh, your Melbourne Moorabbin, um, Essendon, um, Jandicott, Parafield in uh, South Australia, so on and so forth. And then the smaller airfields were then transferred out of federal ownership and funding to local councils under a, a program called the ALOP transfer. So we had three types of airfields transferred out of federal ownership and federal management. Now, before I go Where much further... Where would Archerfield further, fit in that? Where would Archerfield, Brisbane fit into that? Archerfield would... That's right. It's a secondary general aviation uh, capital city okay. airport. Um, and so uh, before I go much further with that, I just want to talk about the federal model. Prior to privatisation, the federal government was responsible for managing airports and for funding airports. And it had a government organisation responsible for that called the Federal Airports Corporation. And the Federal Airports Corporation was responsible for being the interface between government and the industry, the aviation industry and the travelling public. And it was managing the airports uh, and did so under the direct guidance and management of the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. So FAC answered to a minister and a minister at all time had the power to intervene uh, on aviation airport matters to ensure that the interests of the aviation industry could be protected, that the interests of the travelling public could be protected and that the assets that are owned by the taxpayer could be protected. Uh, and it was a well-proven model. It's a model that's obviously used in the United States and, and other countries. Now, the decision was taken around 1996 to privatise these airports and a process was engaged to sell the airports off under leases, which would enable a private business to step in, take a lease over the top of the airport for a period of up to 99 years, and that they would own, operate, and transfer back to the Commonwealth at the end of that lease period. And so that process kicked off and we ended up with uh, some guidelines established. There were guidelines that said that airports, you could, you know, one company couldn't own all the airports. It, it created a framework to try and create some equity and some balance in this process. Uh, and we ended up with our capital city airports uh, leased out to large property developers who were masquerading as airport people. So we ended up with uh, banking consortiums, uh, superannuation consortiums and property developer consortiums who put together airport management companies and who recognised from the outset, Senator, and I have to say this, there are a lot of good people that are working as part of uh, privatised airport uh, leaseholder management companies. And I don't begrudge those people because they saw an opportunity and the opportunity was the federal government was literally handing its baby and bathwater out in the, the tub and they pounced on it and they recognised that what the government was actually doing was giving them these huge parcels of land that had all of the infrastructure in place. They had water, they had sewerage, they had huge power station <laughs> substations. They looked at it and went, my God, this is just a property developer's dream. If we can get these airport sites, then we can start architecting a very broad and rapid non-aviation redevelopment of these sites. Uh, and 20-odd uh, years later, 30 years later, what we now see right across Australia is our airports being consumed non-aviation to such an extent that we even have airports that are now becoming dangerous uh, in the opinions of uh, that's what Simon, Simon McDermott and you were talking about briefly last week. That's exactly right. And so uh, great examples of airports like Essendon Airport where you now have industry associations and bodies that are desperately concerned with how close the non-aviation development has been allowed up uh, to the runways that it's creating obstacle issues uh, and of course, these are risks. We, you know, I think I was on live television at one point in time, and I said to a journalist, "You don't uh, develop an airport and install a DFO to make it safer. Uh, you're installing a DFO to make money." 
uh, and the prioritization of profits ahead of industry safety is something that is glaringly obvious uh, and is let, creating let me guess, the, the when, when the when the contracts were or the leases were were sold um, the federal government probably didn't look upon it as a developer's paradise but the buyers did so they probably got it for a good price and and in many they're cases, making a lot of money out of it well in many cases senator the uh the companies that took the leases and bought these leases from the commonwealth paid very little i think in jandicott the figure is somewhere around 20 odd million was paid for the lease on jandicott airport in western australia and just recently that airport has sold for 1.3 billion dollars to the Dexas property group backed by a superannuation fund and so uh, i guess if you're in the property developer airport manager uh, market you're looking at this going my god these are staggering returns and if you're a superannuation fund and you could just bank a billion dollar earn on a parcel of land that you've paid 20 million dollars for i mean it's just it's profound to say the least not only um, not only that even at the billion dollar purchase price for the new owners um they can see a lot of upside in that they must otherwise they wouldn't have paid so much money for it well Dex's so that property means group. they're sitting on a gold mine yeah, Dexas Property Group and the superannuation fund that have just bought Jandicott identified that there is still 60% of the airport site that they believe they can convert. Uh, and that's what they're looking at. Their greenfield is the area that they can turn into further non-aviation. So, um, so it's, that, it's, a, it's a gift um, or a very vastly under underpriced asset that has been sold from the public to a private investor. It is now, Senator. I'll just I'll make you aware as we have our conversation here today. Uh, members of Air, of AOPA and industry supporters will be writing in their comments and questions, uh, and they you'll see them flash up on screen. You can see Shannon Baker's just put a, yep. a comment up. He's actually based out of Western Australia, thanking you for taking an interest today, uh, and he's gone further to say that Jandicott was almost wiped off the map a few years ago, um, and he's provided some further details now. It. Where, where we've gotten to in what I've just described is that we've started the airport privatisation process 96. It attracted a wholesale amount of interest by property developers and consortiums backed by banking groups and superannuation funds and other venture capital um, firms. And some of them were offshore interests, some of them were local interests. Uh, these people saw it as an opportunity for non-aviation, but it was sold to the Commonwealth on each of their applications that they saw nothing but massive potential for aviation. So now what we've got that picture in place, we've sold off these airports, local councils inherited all the other airports and local councils were give, each given a little bit of money. They were signed these airports and basically a lot of the councils thought that they'd hit payday. They thought that these airports were going to be a real earner and they were quite excited about it. And I can speak to it because my father, um, I come from a local uh, government family and uh, my uh, uncle was um, a general manager, CEO of a council. My father's involved in works management uh, at a council. So um, I had first-hand knowledge of the councils that they were part of that inherited their airports and their thinking. Um, but we've we've sold off these airports. They've been given to these companies. Now, fast forward 20-odd years later, what have we seen? Well, the first thing is the how I think it was the, the Howard government at the time said that the fundamental of airport privatisation was to spur investment and development of aviation. It was to unlock aviation across the country. It was to create opportunities for aviation across the country. It was supposedly going to bring this focused and determined investment into aviation. So have we seen that outcome? And the answer is a glaring no. What we've seen over the last 20 odd years, 25 years since privatization is the wholesale and systematic raping of the general aviation industry. Small to medium sized businesses at these airport locations have virtually been driven out of business through uncontrolled record increases in property leasehold rentals and leases. The cost of basing yourself at an airport today is by a quantum and factor that was unimaginable at the time of privatization, i.e. I'm sure if you'd asked the government at the time what the cost impact would be on industry, they probably would have said, okay, look, if there was a 25% uh, increase in costs over the next 10 years, fair enough. Well, we're talking increases that run into the two, three and 4,000%. And this is as profound as it is because what it has done is number one, it has made airport management leaseholders money 
But more importantly, it has completely consumed the general aviation industry's capacity to invest in itself. It has taken financial sustainability out of general aviation business. It's given the money to property developers who, in many cases, haven't really invested much of that back into aviation. And it's removed small to medium sized businesses ability to, to employ the correct levels of staff. It has undermined their ability to finance new equipment and capital needed to grow these aviation businesses. Keeping in perspective as well, Senator, that if you're an aviation business based at a privatised airport, you can't get a loan to build buildings and to, to grow because you don't own the property. If you go to the bank and you say to the bank, I've got a 10 year lease at Bankstown Airport and I need to build a $3 million facility to service and maintain airplanes, they're gonna say, you've got no capital to underpin this loan. So we want you to put up your private house as security. And the first rule of running a business is you never bet the house. And so small to medium sized businesses in many respects as a consequence of this privatization have been locked out of gaining capital finance to grow these companies and to invest back into the businesses as needed. The ultimate litmus, though, the litmus test for the success of privatisation for general aviation would be to do a measure as to how many businesses today at these airports were there at the time of privatisation. How many businesses survived? Now, whilst I don't have the direct statistical data, what I do have is I have six years of travelling the industry and six years of meeting with companies and six years of interacting at the grassroots of aviation and talking with business owners on a daily basis. And I can tell you that the feedback that is overwhelmingly clear to me as just an ordinary person inquiring is that it's had a devastating impact and that the number of businesses left at these airports that were originally there at privatisation is very few. And I know uh, our business uh, for AOPA, and I'm also involved in an aviation business externally called Falcon Air, uh, but our business and our operations are based at Bankstown Airport and Bankstown Airport has had a tremendous turnover of businesses in and businesses out. And I can drive you around the airport site and I would welcome, obviously there's an election on which makes it very difficult, but after this election process, I would very much welcome you uh, to come to Sydney and to take a tour of our facilities at, at Bankstown Airport and see with your own eyes as to what's going on. And I could possibly arrange for you to do a tour out at Archerfield. We have plenty of members all over the country that would love to be able to walk you around and show you what's I'd happening. Be, I'd be keen on doing that, whether it be at Archerfield or, or and uh, Sydney, we could do it on the way to Canberra one day. That'd be brilliant. Just, I think just stop off the day before to be able to see it with your own eyes, because the airport management companies will tell you what a great job they're doing. In fact, one of the arguments that I always have thrown at me, if I give a public address on these issues or I do an interview, um, very quickly the airport managements will either write me a filthy letter or threaten to sue me, um, and will say to me, "But Mr. Morgan, we are spending millions of dollars on runway pavements and lighting and taxiway." And I, I have the same response to all of them: "Don't ask me to congratulate you for what are your obligations." When you bought an airport, it's your obligation to maintain it. You shouldn't be asking for the industry to congratulate you for maintaining it. The same way as if I rent out an investment property, I don't go and congratulate and thank my tenant for not destroying the place. It's an expectation that if you rent something, you're going to look after it. Uh, and I think that it's, it's an important distinction that needs to be made here because that is what these privatised airport management companies are. They're a rental tenant. They don't own the asset. It belongs to every, all of us. It belongs to the Australian people. And that's often a, an issue that's forgotten in this debate is that we, the Australian people, are actually the owner of, this air, of these airports. We own those assets. They are there for our amenity. And we lease them to these private companies for them to run our asset so that they are accessible and that they are successfully maintained and that they are grown. And, and I think at the moment there's some really justifiable arguments to say uh, that the assets aren't being maintained. And I've recently, Senator, been putting together a series of videos where I just walk around, you know, and I say that when I'm confronted by the airport staff doing this, I say, hang on, I'm just a dumb kid from a dairy farming family, you know, like I'm just filming. I don't know why it's so controversial. If I film a building and you've got a tree growing out of the gutters, and you're telling our Prime Minister and you're telling the Department of Infrastructure and our Deputy Prime Minister and our elected officials you're doing a good job maintaining the airport site, then why is there a tree growing out of a gutter? And this is not a small tree, Senator. Some of these trees growing out of these gutters are well-established native trees that I'm sure nurseries would spend years cultivating. Uh, and this is happening at airport sites. We're seeing buildings that have never been painted since privatisation, and they're looking, they honestly look like you're touring an airport in Nairobi. You're not 
touring an airport in a capital city in Australia. So uh, it is having an impact. I want to talk a little bit now about some more of the structural impact. Uh, I'm often asked... So you, you, had, you had two topics, one one airport privatisation. What was the other one? What is the I'm other one? I'm talking about CASA, uh, over-regulation of the industry at the hands of CASA, which is a very important issue. But I'm going to finish off on the airports issue just on this, and, I, again, I could talk for hours on this. I'm, people say I'm an underwater submarine talking. Um, with businesses... Go ahead, because I'm, I'm here to listen. You're the expert, okay. I'm not. <laughs> with respect to the privatised airports... They've driven up the costs of these uh, for aviation businesses to be based at these locations. And obviously the, the rental expenses have a direct impact on the ability uh, of these businesses to provide its product and its services. But it gets worse. It's not just the increases on the aviation properties that's damaging our industry. It has been the implementation of wholesale non-aviation real estate development at airports that's actually doing the most damage. Now, the reason that this is doing so much damage to aviation is very simple to understand. An airport like Bankstown Airport, and I'll use Bankstown Airport simply because I'm based there and I'm so familiar with what's going on there. An airport such as Bankstown has an enormous amount of space on it. The space that we have on the airport was designed to allow for expansion of aviation industry uh, expansion of aviation supply chain, manufacturing, you name it. And of course, Senator, we're, we're existing in a time right now where the, where the issue of Australian sovereignty and our capacity as a nation to deal with our defence requirements and our ability to protect Australia are starting to come into sharp focus. And these airport sites were in fact built on that very fundamental. Bankstown Airport was built during the war, during a time in which these questions were at the, at the forefront of government thinking and they built these airports to provide reserve locations and, and to allocate space where they could ramp up aircraft manufacturing, they could ramp up defence industry manufacturing because obviously when, you know, we all don't want war, we all don't want conflict, but when it comes, it comes and you have to respond and you've got to get moving quickly. And so these sites were all set up as part of our national protection. These spaces have been eroded over the past 25 years to a point where some of the airports, it's getting difficult to do any more large development. But at Bankstown Airport, we've got these large developments taking place. And they're leasing out extremely large portions of commercial estates to big, offshore logistics companies, big offshore air conditioning businesses, uh, anything that's not to do with aviation is getting a foothold. And they're paying such prices for this real estate that, that what that is doing is that is driving up the total real estate value of the airport precinct. Now, that is then in turn placing additional pressure on the airport because when an aviation small to medium sized business lease at one of these airports becomes due for renegotiation, the airport simply says, well, the property value at Bankstown is now worth this and your new rate now needs to be up here. And so we've got small to medium sized aviation businesses now being forced into higher and higher and higher and higher. And it's not going to end because they keep opening more of these non-aviation estates and ramping up the value to these record levels. And businesses just can't keep affording to pay the increases. It's breaking them. And, you know, I've got some numbers, you know, a Bellman hangar, which is a standard 30 metre by 30 metre hangar at Bankstown Airport. They're wartime hangars. They're 80 year old. These hangars, you know, you can rent a Bellman hangar at Tamworth Airport and pay $20,000 a year for it. Or you can rent one at um, Wollongong Airport and pay $20,000 a year for it. If you want to rent that same hangar at Bankstown Airport, it's going to cost you $180,000 a year, if not $200,000 a year. Now, if you're maintaining self-perpetuating uh, or self-fulfilling thing, because as as the as the prices go up, then the realist, then the general aviators leave, and then other people come in, and then that makes it even worse. So it's even higher cost for general aviators in the next. And scarily, next scarily, Senator, in many cases, the federal government's helping this happen. We've got airport locations at local councils around the countryside where the local council will apply for federal government grants. To, to 
make their airports bigger. We want to put in bigger surfaces. We want to put in bigger lighting. We want to put in bigger aprons. We want to build non-aviation estates because they're going to help us, quote, unquote, fund the airport. Then they go build a commercial estate. They rent it out. It drives up the land value. And next thing you know, the council's asking for even higher rentals. And so when the federal government's giving money to these airports, thinking what it's doing is helping improve aviation, it's actually also helping drive the price up because they have never implemented any kind of pricing protection or regulatory control to stop what has just become, and I'll quote Dick Smith, a never-ending ratchet of increasing costs. It's just well, generally ratchet speaking, more ratchet more. Excuse me for interrupting, Ben, but generally speaking, what's the attitude towards the local councils taking on this response, having this responsibility thrust on them after so many years now? Were they positive? Are they against it? It would seem to be an extra burden, but maybe they're getting revenue for it. I don't know. Some of the airport locations have been successful in cultivating strong aviation uses of their website, of their, their, their airport sites. Uh, and uh, those airports have a multitude of small to medium sized aviation on them and they've become sustainable airports. Unfortunately, they are the minority. The vast majority of cases, the councils regard their airport as a waste of community money. And I, in the six years that I've been with AOPA, I have spent countless uh, days on the telephone, in meetings, representing the industry at council meetings, writing letters to councillors, meeting with councillors, trying to convey the message that an airport should have the same significance to every community as the main road does or any other uh, important a community facility. And now a great example of this was a dispute that broke out between um, the Wagga uh, Council and the Wagga Aviation Industry who wanted to impose really large aircraft parking and aircraft movement fees at Wagga Airport for small to medium sized aviation. Now I went and met with the council on this issue and I said, you know, you've got a, a lake at Wagga and you have all these council funded boat ramps. Why don't you charge the boat owners to park a boat down a boat ramp? And they say to me, well, Ben, that's a, that's a community amenity. And I said, well, why is an airport not a community amenity? And I'll tell you why. There was a fundamental requirement for councils a number of years ago to change their accounting practices with respect to airports. If they wanted to qualify for grants for their airports, their airports had to be cost accounted. And as a consequence of that cost accounting process, Councils were declaring on their financial accounts that the airport was a business unit and it was incurring expenses and it was generating income and it was incurring losses because the amount of income an airport can generate in, you know, let's go at the back of, you know, Burke. Uh, some of these little airports, they don't generate any money at all, but they do cost the, the local uh, community, you know, fifty dollars to $100,000 a year to run it. Now, the council provides that community amenity because, let's face it, what do, what do we see all the time in Australia? We see floods, we see bushfires, we see natural disaster. And what are the first things we need as a community during these times? We need an airport. We've got to get those emergency services in. We've got to get the aerial firefighting services in. We've got to get the aerial police assets in. We've got to, uh, we've got to be able to move food. I mean, look at what we saw in the Lismore floods recently. What we saw take place up in Lismore in that region was the greatest demonstration of the value and amenity of general, to, of general aviation to the national economy and to the very fabric of the Australian people, that we had an ability during a, a critical time to get supplies in, to get food in, to get water in, to get medicines in, and at the same time to, to maintain around-the-clock operations with helicopters uh, and other aerial assets so that we could save as many lives as possible. And again, a huge shout out, Senator, a huge shout out to the private general aviation businesses in that area that with no assistance and without being called on, dropped everything to go to the rescue of the people in that area uh, and did so at great expenses to themselves. And in many cases, a lot of those operators lost a lot of equipment and a, a huge amount of investment in their businesses to be out there uh, doing that. But they did do that and it was a great demonstration. And so local councils uh, really have a huge responsibility to their communities to educate them correctly as to what the value of these airports truly are, not only to the local community, but to the, to the national fabric. But of course, it's a very hard argument to convince a council to take that attitude when the council's spending 
$100,000 a year on the airport, it cost accounts the airport in such a manner that it shows up on the balance sheet as a loss maker. And then you have councillors who come along, and I don't want to be critical of councillors because there's a lot of very good councillors out there. But unfortunately, I spend a lot of time coming up against councillors who come into their role and they just look at the loss and they say, get rid of it. It's very short-sighted and I, I'm sure you would, I'm seeing you nod, I'm sure you probably would agree with me that cutting your nose off despite your face is not usually, a, uh, it doesn't produce good outcomes. But well, People start making well, short-term decisions which undermine the future, the viability in the future. Just that, to, that's just exactly to keep right. the head above water, that's what happens. That's right. And so the councils are forced to make financial decisions. Um, but as I, uh, I've, I've become clever at certain things. Uh, when I now go into these debates, I, I download the council's annual report and I'll look at the annual report and I'll say, how much money did they spend on pathways? How much money did they spend on parks and gardens? How much money did they spend on the swimming pool? And when you actually add up what a council is investing on average, what a council is investing on parks, gardens, footpaths, artworks and amenities, the airport is usually but a minor fraction. And I would often say to councillors and general managers of councils, how is it that within your shire you maintain three and a half thousand kilometres of road, yet you're complaining about funding less than one kilometre of it? And that's what you're funding in an airport. You're funding about a kilometre of road for the runway and a little bit of uh, road for the taxiways and you're doing a little bit of mowing. And so... Uh, we need a better model. There needs to be a better federal support framework for local councils that are maintaining these airports because the consequences of us not supporting them is that they are closing these airports down. And that is the biggest threat that we now have to the viability uh, of aviation in Australia is that the airports themselves have become a critical choke point. Privatised airports are pricing aviation out privatised airports are prioritising non-aviation and it is not benefiting aviation. And I would question uh, when you have developments at a privatised airport and a privatised company comes along and seeks the minister's approval to do a $500 million non-aviation development, I would be asking a question that if the Australian taxpayer is going to approve you to do uh, this non-aviation development, I want to know what the Australian taxpayer who's involved in aviation business gets as a benefit. Why are we as the taxpayer giving non-aviation businesses a priority at aviation sites and why are we giving these airport leaseholders the opportunity to make billions if all we're getting in return for it is increased lease costs, increased user charges, further pressure and stress on the success and sustainability of aviation business and, of course, if it's driving unemployment, if it's causing businesses to close down, you've got to question why we're doing it. Because I've had politicians on both the Liberal National side and politicians, Senator, on the Labor side. They're both responsible for this. And I think um, the responsibility of fixing it lay with them both. Uh, but on both sides, what I've heard them say to me is, oh, Ben, um, they're private businesses and we can't interfere. Well, we're... <laughs> You're the Commonwealth. Well, actually, <laughs> actually, the ultimate, the ultimate boss or the supervisor of this, the people who are meant to be accountable, are the voters. Because what's happened in this country is we too rarely voted for Liberal and Nationals, and then when when we get tired of them, we realise they're not making a good job. We vote for the Labor Party, and when we get tired of them, we vote back because people think there are only the two options. That's it, and the voter doesn't realise that there are many options out there, and the voter needs to hold them accountable by by valuing the vote, we get so many people not even voting properly or not bothering to vote. So it really has to be the only people that can change the constitution of our country is is the voter. The voters are in charge or should be in charge, but for too long now, voters have just let the Liberal Party and National Party run and the Labor Party run without any real accountability. And quite frankly, a lot of these, these policies that you're talking about are due to both in cahoots. Some of them well, are internationally driven, and that's that's something we've been we've been talking about for a long time. Pauline's yeah. been discussing that since 1996. The UN's influence in this country, the foreign inter interests that control our country, that don't pay tax, don't pay to use our assets, but but can can destroy um, an industry and not even care about it. Well, Senator, I, you know, I raised this. I've, I've raised this question on both sides, and I, I would raise the you know I've raised the topic here, and that is if. 
The purpose of privatising Australia's airports was to simply create non-aviation real estate opportunities for property developers. Then I yeah. think we, we as a nation and our government need to radically rethink what the hell it's doing because this is exactly what's going on. Make no mistakes. This is not, you know, this is not fanciful bullshit. This is real. Aviation has been displaced and it has been run off airport sites so that the Australian taxpayer can gift superannuation funds and property developers with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of free money. And that is effectively what we've done here. Keep in perspective, they didn't buy the land, they bought an operating lease over the airport and they are part of their master planning. They're supposed to go back to the Commonwealth and they're to seek the minister's signature on their plans to develop the site. So you've got to ask yourself a question. Why has Labor ministers and why have Liberal national ministers signed off on these master plans where there has been zero benefit to aviation? And these are questions that if I were a senator in, in, and I would have to say, I've said this to all the senators I've interviewed, I wish to God I was a senator because I would stand on the floor in the parliament and I would ask that question. Why has the government on either side continued to sign off on these master plans and allowed such wholesale redevelopment of these airports for non-aviation and all the while it's driven up the costs of aviation to be at these sites it's introduced new fees and charges at these aviation sites. It's made access and equity poorer. What benefit to the Australian people are we getting from allowing superannuation funds and property developers to make hundreds of millions of dollars of free money? Because we're not advancing our industry. We're not cultivating our industry. We're not encouraging our industry. We're not growing our industry. It's having the direct opposite effect. And I think, uh, in this instance, it is almost justifiable at this point. And I think it is just, I'll say it is justifiable at this point that we recognise that the privatisation of the major airports has failed outside of the international uh, airports. It has failed for general aviation. And if it means we have to cancel those privatised leases over the top of the sites and refederalise them so that we can protect and foster the industry and get general aviation growing again and reinsert aviation as a strong uh, national industry sector, then maybe that's what we've got to do. And when the government says we don't have the money to do it, I call BS on that. The, the government has got the money to fix this problem. The government's also had the controls for the last 25 years to see to it that it didn't do it. It just has to choose to want to do these things. Uh, and so I think probably no point trying to labour these points any further in this conversation on airport privatisation. But I'd, I'd um, like to add a couple of comments on it. But one of the fundamental things we're up against, Ben, is... The fact, and it is a fact, that governments, state and federal, make policies, make decisions, often without any recourse to the data, without any recourse to the facts. They make them in a vacuum to look after either vested interests, get a headline, uh, look after their mates, um, do the easy thing, avoid accountability, avoid scrutiny. These are the things that drive governments. And it doesn't matter what, what you're saying here, can resonate with our electricity policies in the country. Well, when I say our, not one nation's because we're opposed to it, but but to um, the policies of state and federal governments with regard to electricity. And as, as important as aviation is, and energy is even more important because it's what fuels your planes. It's what drives, keeps the lights on in, in your terminals and, and, and hangars. Avia, uh, energy, it's what with regard, what's what happened, has happened to water policy. It's what's happened to our infrastructure in this country. And quite frankly, I mean, I know what you're doing. I like what you're saying. It makes perfect sense. I'll check the facts, but it makes perfect sense to me what you're saying. The logic is there. But what I've seen, I've worked uh, 10 years voluntarily opposing the climate scam that the government has pushed. And when I get down to the detail, I'm the only politician anywhere in the world, I'm told, by reliable sources who know about what's happening in other, in other jurisdictions around the world. I'm the only politician that's held a government science agency accountable for their so-called climate advice. And there is completely bullshit driving it. So it's happening in energy. It's happening in water. It's happening in property rights. These have all been stolen. It's happening in the climate policies that drive the energy policies. So I'm not trying to, not trying to, to downgrade at all. I'm trying to emphasize by saying this is 
um, not trying to downgrade what you're doing, but I'm trying to emphasize because this is the core problem. What you're facing is complete lack of accountability. You know, you, you can't have core assets in private hands you, because then you give a, a private company a monopoly and they're going to rip out whatever they can and they're, get, they're going to find out whatever, whichever way they can. I'm in favor of private ownership of assets. Uh, wherever possible, but not where there's a monopoly. And you certainly don't get a well-developed, um, you don't certainly don't get a well-developed asset that the public has paid for and then hand it over and let them exploit it in another direction while destroying your core business, which is what you're telling me is happening, correct? Absolutely. I think the facts speak for themselves and anybody within uh, any of the government's past and the government of today and hopefully the government post-election who cares to come out to these sites and to see them firsthand, we'll see it's not working. It is not working. And if it's left continue on the current trajectory, we will not have a small to medium sized general aviation industry within any capital city location left in Australia. They will have all been pushed out because of the rising tsunami of cost that pertains purely to the increasing property uh, price threshold driven by wholesale non-aviation development at these sites. I, I want to comment, you mentioned energy. Would it surprise you to learn that if you're a business located at Bankstown Airport, you can't choose who your energy provider is? We have to buy our energy from the privatised airport leaseholder who adds their margin, no doubt. That's just we have no choice. You know, uh, Warren, Warren Buffett, the world's most accomplished investor, he said that the ultimate investment for him is having a toll bridge, the only toll bridge across a river. That's it. You have to use his his toll bridge. That's well, what he calls well, a Canada, in Queensland that's, that's at Archerfield. Facing. In Queensland at Archerfield Airport, small to medium size aviation businesses at Archerfield in your in your area of constituency. Uh, no longer have a choice of fuel supplier. The airport decided there was more money to be made getting in on the fuel supply game than it was leasing premises to independent fuel companies and decided to step in and become the fuel company and the airport. So and they've, the created their own, they've created their own monopoly. Correct. They've created nobody, their own Warren Buffett. Nobody, absolutely nobody from the federal government has cared, and we've made them aware, Nobody wants to answer to it. Nobody wants to provide a solution. And I know for a fact that the airport manager, the airport leaseholder management company at Bankstown are now exploring to do the same thing. They will not be happy until every single last one of us in aviation are paying for every single thing we do, whether we move sideways. Right now, if I push an aeroplane outside of my hangar at Bankstown Airport and I park it on the ramp, they consider it to be an airport movement, even though I'm a leaseholder and I'm paying the, the highest rental rates out of any airport in the country, if I move the aeroplane out, it's an airport movement, boom, that's a service charge. And they drive around in their little vehicles with their little notepads and they, like, like spy versus spy, oh, good, good bang, and hit them. And the problem is, is that if you're an aircraft owner, this is adding up. It's, it's death by a thousand cuts. And it's just not sustainable. And you've, I think you've just said it in, in very short and succinct words that when you take a critical public asset and you put it in the hands of a private corporation who is motivated by but one thing, profit. They don't care about the success of the industry. They don't care if the businesses change over 10 times in one year. All they care about is making money. And they, their decisions are motivated on that one fundamental. I said it at the outset. You don't build a half-billion-dollar non-aviation real estate at Bankstown Airport to improve airport safety or to improve aviation. You build it to make money. That is it. And if well, all we're doing as the taxpayer is handing private companies a licence to make free money, then I think that the Commonwealth, at this stage, it would behoove the Commonwealth to simply say, enough's enough. This is just an abuse of the concept of privatisation. Right. Either the airports are there to benefit aviation or you don't get to have a private lease over them. So I think I think it's at that point. So if you look at the way our country is set up, it was copied in, in terms of the Constitution. It's one of the fundamental foundations for the Constitution is competitive federalism. 
right? So the majority of services are to be provided for by the states. Now, whether you agree with it or not, just, just hang on for the argument. It might not apply to general aid, might not apply to aircraft regulations, all right? That might be a federal thing. But you, you for example, electricity generation, state, state responsibility. If you, as one state, allow the assets to dwindle or for someone to, to rip money out of them, you raise the price of electricity. Business leaves your state and goes elsewhere. And so what the government has to do then, the state government has to do, is to fix the running of its energy generators. South Australia has destroyed its energy sector and people have left South Australia for Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales. Victoria is now destroying its electricity generation sector and people are leaving Victoria. So what happened in, 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 uh, in the past, if you have one, one state that, go, that is backward or inefficient, people leave. And then the voters get pissed off and then the voters change the government. That's the way it's supposed to happen. That's the way it used to happen. But now what we've seen over the last 40 years, 50 years, is the federal government take more and more control over more and more of the state's responsibilities. You've got no competitive federalism. You've got just got one unaccountable entity, the federal government, running it. And then you, then you don't have competition. So in effect, what we've got with competitive federalism where the states run things, and that's the way our constitution is set up, you have competition which brings accountability. With the federal government, you don't have that. Now, there are certain things with the federal government you must have. Defence, foreign affairs can only be, can only be federal things. Maybe aircraft uh, aviation regulations, but not general aviation, I would put to you. So that's just need to think right back to basics. Where would you get accountability? Because clearly you are not getting people uh, accountable to the general aviation needs. You're getting people accountable to their own hip pocket needs. That, that's what you've got destroying your industry. So you've just created a really awesome uh, a segue for us to change uh, topics away from airports. And uh, Senator, as you can tell, I'm very, I'm very passionate about what's happening to airports in Australia because they are our, they're our critical infrastructure. If we lose the airports, if we lose the ability to have an equity of access, an affordable equity of access to these airports, uh, it screws the aviation industry tremendously. Uh, to a point where it won't function. And we're, we're very, very close to being at a point where I believe the ability of the industry to, to remain sustainable has already been undermined, if not to such an extent that it's, in many cases, permanent damage has been done. I think it can be reversed. It could be reversed quickly with po uh, political leaders who have some courage and also both sides of parliament recognising that they both hold responsibility because of their inaction. And instead of sitting back saying, and I, and I think I raised this with you and I'll say it publicly, you know, I've sat in meetings. I have sat in meetings where the Labor Party representative said to me, Ben, we'd really like to, you know, we'd, we'd really like to muscle into this. But if we go out there and we do this, the Liberal National guys will attack us straight away. And the funny thing is when I go and meet with the Liberal National guys, They'll say to me, Ben, we really want to change this. And, and I've got some, and I have to make very clear, I'm extremely supportive of a range of uh, Liberal National representatives that we work with, just as I'm supportive of yourself and I'm supportive of uh, Senator Glenn Stirl and others. You know, we, we will work with politicians who work to sensibly advance the cause of aviation. That means we work with everybody. Um, See, we, don't, we're, we don't care about getting flack so long as we're, we're on the right track because if we start getting flack for something, it shows we're over the target. <laughs> That's a famous, famous. And all you question. need, all you need to do to counter us is to come up with better data and better arguments. Because Pauline and I insist that we we make our decisions based upon solid data and facts. And what we've seen in so many debates, they're coming towards us slowly but surely because we have got the data and we haven't shifted. They might call us all kinds of names, labels. But that doesn't worry. That encourages us because it shows we're on track. You know what I mean? So very, I, I don't, very get, famous, I don't get it. Very famous quote, uh, when you're over the target, the flak intensifies. Uh, yeah. But both sides, both sides of the political aisle are using the same excuse. If we go out and we start this process, we'll be attacked. I think we need political leadership that gets beyond this inane, asinine uh, commentary that we can't do it because the others might attack us. How about you both come out together and you do it. And I think that this is where I see such a role for uh, senators such as yourselves and many of the independents. I, I'm keeping a very broad mind about this current election and uh, it, 
probably not for me to delve too far into projections or what I think, but I think what's very clear is there is a growing sentiment, not only within the aviation industry, but broadly amongst the Australian people, that this major two-party system is failing. It's not working. We're not fixing issues. And I have to say that as someone who is employed on behalf of our members uh, to advocate for change and to focus my energies and my efforts on issues that are important, I, it is my greatest frustration that we are having a conversation today about issues. We were having a conversation five years ago, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, which brings me to this next subject, which is about CASA and the regulation of the Australian aviation industry. Uh, coincidentally, the fact that we're running a um, I guess, testament to AOPA being so apolitical and that we will work with all sides of government. This Sunday, uh, we are hosting uh, South Australian Senator Rex Patrick, uh, who will be um, delivering a May Day address uh, to gathered uh, participants in the audience and mainstream media that are going to be there. He's going to be talking about his time in the Senate uh, and having an opportunity to, uh, I guess, uh, probe CASA on a multitude of issues and his assessment of just how bad the situation has gotten and the fact that we really do need a new strategy to try and drive some meaningful change and to get it done quickly. And so um, uh, he's going to be there uh, this Sunday to deliver that speech. But uh, as a pure coincidence, a person contacted me uh, shortly after we made that announcement and they just said, oh, Mr Morgan, I'm, I, I need to get a, a consent approval from you. We'd like to use some material that was published by AOPA during the Howard government years. Um, and I originally got the request and thought, what's this about? You know, it, <laughs> I get a lot of weird requests at the time. But I phoned this guy you know, and in the end he said, oh, I'm doing a PhD. Uh, and my thesis is on advocacy and engagement. And AOPA has some pretty prolific engagement with government. And he said, Ben, I found a form letter that AOPA distributed to thousands of people across the aviation industry that was signed and sent to the Howard government. And it was specifically a form letter that addressed this issue, which is that the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and our members and industry supporters were calling on the government in 1997. That was the first year out of, first year out of high school for me. 1997 outlining that the CASA board had become stuffed with political appointees and cronies and that it must be filled with people with genuine, direct aviation experience and qualification and ties to ensure that the National Aviation Safety Regulator could be governed by those that understood where the challenges lay and where the solutions needed to be applied. I was blown away that in 1997, my first year out of high school, I'm 43 this year, that the same problem then exists today, that instead of a board of directors managing the National Safety Regulator, which is a statutory, independent statutory authority, and I'll talk a little bit about this, instead of the board of directors being governed by representatives, flight training industry, business accomplished, we've got so many highly accomplished flight training industry business people who would ideally be suited to sit on that board. We have incredibly experienced and accomplished maintenance industry business owners who would be ideally suited to sitting on that board. We have um, commercial pilots, experienced private aviators, experienced recreational aviators. We have such a depth of talent and capability in the people of aviation that if I were in charge, if someone said tomorrow, Ben, you, you are the minister, you're going to get to choose the board of CASA. I'd be like, my God, this is going to be a power board. We're going to get guys that understand the complexity. They understand the difficulty of working with this system because now more than ever, and CASA, by the way, has needed this for quite some time. Now more than ever, they need a board that can support real reform, that understand when they're being BSed by executive management. They understand when they're being BS by middle management. They understand, as they say, where the skeletons are. It needs a board that can actually support meaningful reform and has the fortitude to drive meaningful reform. Not to, you know, we can't do too much because we don't want to upset the apple cart. Right now we need the apple cart well and truly upset. It needs to be thrown out, we need a whole new cart built. I've got to fix this. And so I was just blown away that 
on the eve of putting this um, May Day address together that I'd be contacted by a PhD uh, student doing their thesis on political engagement and that it would just by total coincidence be an engagement by AOPA on their efforts to try and build awareness with, with John Howard directly that the board needed to be representative of the industry. You've got to stop these quango appointees. You got to, I mean, it's, I mean, at times CASA have had gas and oil pipeline executives. It's had, you know, what clearly look like political party um, parking slots for people who might be pre-selected into the future that need to hold a position for some time. It's been a joke. And everyone in the aviation industry, uh, Senator, has known just how rotten it really has been. And yet no one has been prepared to speak up. And I, I well, sometimes well. lament with some of our industry partners, how disappointing it is that, that behind the scenes, everyone's fervently upset about it, but we're not getting that communication out there. People aren't being out there, you know, loudly saying, this has got to stop. We've got to stop these kinds of appointments happening. Well, one of the things that I'd like to say in response, uh, and this is to give you encouragement, not to disillusion you um, or overwhelm you, but if you look at what we've just been through in the last two years, complete mismanagement of, of a virus, complete mismanagement. I won't go into the details, but I have, have the facts from the federal government. It's just been complete mismanagement, it's destroyed lives, destroyed livelihoods, destroyed many people's careers. What's been going on is complete overreach. It's inhuman. If you look at the body that is overseeing doctors and nurses, it's called AHPRA, Australian Health uh, Practitioners Regulatory Agency, Prudential Regulatory Agency. So what these guys are doing they're butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. They've got everyone on there, bar doctors and, and healthcare professionals. And what they're doing is they're telling the doctors what they must say and what they must do. And if, if they dare go against that, the doctors lose their registration. And that's what's happened. That's what's put in place complete mismanagement of this COVID virus. And so we've had an enormous cost. And, and just, just uh, six weeks ago, I was invited to a meeting of, of uh, doctors, specialists, general practitioners, uh, a couple of lawyers who suddenly realized they'd lost their healthcare sector, completely lost their healthcare service. And what we've got now is a disease industry that tells them what to prescribe. And that's destroying the healthcare sector. It's destroying trust in doctors, which will, which will erode their future. So uh, that, that's one thing. Then we've also got the uh, what I call the Aboriginal industry. And many Aboriginals agree with me on this. We've got, uh, I think it's $30 billion a year spent on the Aboriginal industry. When you go to the Aboriginal communities, the communities are not getting that money. The, the people who are taking the money are the, the middlemen in between, blacks and whites, consultants, lawyers. And, and it was put to me in very, very plain language by an islander in the Torres Strait Islands. And he said to me, because I asked him, it seems to me if you focus on closing the gap, you will perpetuate what you focus on. You'll perpetuate the gap. And he said, mate, it's not even that, that, that difficult. The simple fact is that there are people here who make money out of their gap being gap existing. How the hell do you think they're going to get rid of the gap when they're making money out of it? So the complete distortion of what people need and what people should be aligned to drive, that's what you've got by the sound of it. I, I've got to check it, so I'm not going to just endorse what you're saying, but um, it sounds to me what, what, when, when, when you tell me about what, what's happening with general aviation and what you said in a conversation last week, I've been thinking about it, and it seems like they've completely lost touch. And it's exactly what you said. And you go back to my first point. In the absence of data, they start making stupid decisions that are there to look after vested interests, look after their headlines, look after the, the, the votes. And they appear to be doing good, but they're actually doing harm. And then in the absence of data, you start appointing donkeys to your boards and who've gotten and, and who will never say no to the government, who will only, uh, only support the government. And when you've got Liberal and Labor together, they're a duopoly that's been passing. They're, 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 their policies are almost identical, almost identical. So what you've got is the bureaucrats running the company in the country and governments coming in from one Labor or from Liberal nationals and just doing what they're told and just perpetuating the system, never wanting to rock the boat because they put so many people throughout that are full of party hacks, party, party uh, careerists. And that's the problem. We've got to change what's happening in Canberra. Well, you are correct in a number of your assessments there, and I'll unpack a few of them. But we have this organisation called the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, and it's that last word that I believe has done the most damage to aviation oh, yeah. in the past 20-odd uh, years. 
Uh, and Kassel was not always regarded as a authority. Um, it did at, it did at one point in time in its life act more as an administration, uh, but it has been set up in a way in which it is a uh, independent statutory authority. And as I like to explain it to people, CASA over the last 20 years has become the air police. Just about everything that CASA does is now focused on being seen as the air police. And I, I often joke, we can't be that far away from CASA buying its own Blackhawks and its people rappelling in through the roofs wearing black tactical uniforms because just about everything that they do now is focused on ensnaring and entangling the industry in enforcement, surveillance, and then punitive action. Uh, and I have to say from the outset that in my experience, the aviation industry is tremendously responsible, that aircraft owners and pilots and aviation businesses on the whole do not go out each and every day seeking to contrive a way to break the law or to operate illegally. Uh, and Well, the pilot is generally at the front of the plane. Correct. And that it's it's an obvious obvious physical need for that, but if if the first person to die in an aircraft crash is usually the pilot, so Correct. and, and so what the, you have what you have is highly intelligent people. You, you don't get to be a pilot by being silly, so you don't stick around <laughs> by being silly. That's for sure. So um, what happens is you tend to breed fairly conservative people. I mean, the, the number of checks you have to go through, then and it, it's done for a purpose and it's instilled in people. I've seen pilots all the time go through their checklists and they're highly regimented for a reason. Their safety depends upon it and other people's safety depends upon it. Correct. When that's when that's critical, then you have good systems following until you start getting systems that are dodgy and then people want, want to go around them. And that's what happens when you get dodgy systems. You've got to have practical systems that are designed by the people who use the bloody systems. So you've got an aviation industry of responsible people You've got an aviation industry whose standards are largely based on America. The United States aviation industry virtually has written the book on aviation. The US Federal Aviation Administration is in fact a global benchmark on how to successfully run aviation. Most other aviation jurisdictions around the world, because of the timeline that they were formed would base themselves on either the American system or they'd base themselves on the European system, the EASA system. But for today's conversation, I just want to focus on the US system. The US is the world's largest aviation economy. They have the world's largest fleet of aircraft. More aircraft are designed, manufactured in the United States than are designed and manufactured anywhere else in the world. Aircraft engines are largely all designed and manufactured in the United States. The principles of aircraft maintenance are principles developed in the United States. And here in Australia, we run a regulatory system, which is in fact a hybrid that our regulator sought to create, not a copy of the United States system for simplification, but to take a bit of the European system, a bit of the Japanese system, a bit of the US system, a bit of the New Zealand system, and we've created this BITSA, I call it the, the thoroughbred designed by committee, the camel. <laughs> we've got a camel of a regulator which has bits and pieces of every other animal combined into one, and then we're all sitting back as an industry saying, why is this thing the slowest, most cumbersome? useless regulatory framework that man could possibly have ever invented and that's because we allowed a bunch of people to design the system ad hoc and instead of just adopting a proven successful system we decided we'd go and reinvent the wheel now casa over the last 30 years in this country has continually told the commonwealth that it's been advancing a regulatory reform and modernization program to make australia's aviation regulations the most efficient responsive and modern regulations possible. And during that time, they have delivered more pages of regulation, more complexity of regulation, higher costs of, of regulatory compliance and conformance for industry. We're at a point now where it's on record. Aviation businesses have been screaming 
for 30 years of the speed of continual change, rechange, write, rewrite, removal, re-edition. It has been a never-ending treadmill of constant change for the industry. And where we're at today is we have a whole bunch of people down in Canberra, and I'm going to say that there are some great people that are still working inside of CASA today. And I'm actually really surprised that they're still there because of the number of people that are leaving and just, I've had enough. There's some great people that are there. But there are also people inside of CASA today that should have been removed years ago because their thinking has been a failed ideology that has manifested into this regulatory mess that there is virtually unified consensus across the aviation industry that what we're being given in Australia is just not working. Now, when the industry speaks up, Senator, and says, this is not working, CASA comes out, oh, the industry's wrong. IOPA's wrong. Oh, the, you know, the, the, the Licensed Aircraft Engineering Association is wrong. Aircraft Repair Maintenance, Repair Overhaul Business Association, they're wrong. Sport Aircraft Association, they're all wrong. Everyone is always wrong. And I've noticed something in the six years that I've been advocating, that in six years I've watched five Senate inquiries take place. And in five Senate inquiries, I have never once seen the Civil Aviation Safety, uh, Safety Authority sit and take their chair in front of the Commonwealth and admit that the problems we're dealing with today are because they've created the regulatory mess to begin with. They constantly accolade themselves as having delivered an efficient modern system that the Australian taxpayer to date has probably been foisted with over a billion dollars worth of costs for this mess. And these people in Canberra continue to pat themselves on the shoulder and say, we're doing a great job. Now, a fantastic example of just how incapable CASA have become of, uh, in, in respect of doing the job that they're there to do would be this example. We have a piece of legislation in Australia. It's called the Civil Aviation Act. And the Civil Aviation Act is the legislative document that, that was passed by Parliament that creates CASA and says, uh, this is what you're there to do. And in short, you can read all of that legislation, but in short, CASA's responsibility is to do the following. It is to determine what is safe and promulgate regulations to enable it and to determine what is unsafe and to promul promulgate regulations that prohibit it. Now, in fundamental simplicity, that is exactly what a regulator does. It is there to determine what is safe and to go about devising the framework to enable industry and participants to do it. And if it's unsafe and it's a risk that the Australian people deem that it is not wanting to take, then CASA as the responsible organisation is to ensure that it doesn't happen. So that's what CASA does. Now, five can years... I, can I just, just um, interrupt for a minute? Again, it's not to discourage you. It's, it's not to say the situation is hopeless, but it's to point to the core issue because there used to be an entity called the Murray-Darling Basin Commission. I spoke to the last commissioner, Peter Millington. It was disbanded in 2007 when Malcolm Turnbull and John Howard brought in the Water Act of 2007 and they created the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that you just pointed to the last the last word in CASA is authority. And I and I put it to you that the Murray Darling Basin Authority has completely screwed up the Murray Darling Basin Murray Darling Basin because it doesn't listen, it pushes and bullies and intimidates and bellows. And that's the fundamental problem. And we're we're addressing that. But to give you an example of what happened, John Briscoe is is he's dead now, but he was very accomplished lecturer, uh, not lecturer, um, expert on water water policy around the world, and and very highly regarded. And he came down here, I think, in two thousand and seven, before the Turnbull introduced the Howard Turnbull Water Act, and he said, "We've got the best systems in the world for managing water. Consultation between states, but states having the ultimate authority." He came back in two thousand and eleven, and said, "We have now probably gone to the worst." in the world because we have dr driven this for political purposes and now we've got water separated from the land so farmers can't get water paying ever higher prices for water and in the end the customer the, the food consumer pays the cost of this but they've destroyed our Murray Darling Basin because they've changed from a consultation consultative process 
to an authority that imposes things in contradiction of the data. They make regulations willy nilly. They go a hive off on on just like just like uh, the general aviation hives off on their own little uh, their own little track to to look after their real estate investments rather than looking after aviation. And and we've also got now the national electricity market, which is really a national electricity racket. We talked about energy a little while ago. You've got that riddled with regulators who don't know what the hell they're doing. And it's all been centralized. And now we've got regulators setting prices, no market setting prices, whereas before we used to have state governments competitively setting prices. We have screwed this up so badly because we focused on regulating centrally with no accountability. And so that's the core problem. So we've got to change from this liberal labor duopoly because they're the uni party. You, you pointed out, when did the CASA regulations come in? 1997? The no, not I think 1988 is the last, uh, 1988, the last, last major okay, review. We've had, we've had in 2019, but the principles 88. 88, we've had a Labor government, then we had a Liberal government, then we had a Labor government, then we had a Liberal government. Neither of them will fix it. The core problem is in lack of accountability and absolutely shitty governance in this country. Well, look, Senator, I'm not going to disagree <laughs> with your assessment, but the example that I, I, I will give you is that you've got a regulator that's there that's supposed to promulgate what's safe and prohibit what's unsafe. Sounds In good. this country, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority many, many years ago approved a self-administrating aviation body. Now, we've got this very unique thing in Australia that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. It's an aberration here in Australia, and that is instead of CASA simplifying its regulation and reforming its regulation to enable sport and recreational flying to happen under the government system in a reformed environment, as the US has done, as the UK has done, as so many other countries have done, instead of doing that, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority decided it would create regulation to allow people to privatise the individual sectors of our aviation industry so that they have a monopoly over people's access to aviation. So now it's not bad enough that we're dealing with airports that hold monopolies over our access to aviation. We're now seeing the rise of independent private businesses who come in and take a stake and they say, well, we can regulate our sector of aviation a lot more efficiently than CASA can. So if CASA will give us a regulatory monopoly over this sector, we'll go and we'll then impose fees and charges on our members and we'll manage it for them. The only problem with that is people have been thoroughly misled, uh, and I mean thoroughly misled. These privatised monopoly holders are not freedom they are not Nirvana. CASA still controls them just like they control everybody else. And all the industry members have been encouraged to do is to thrust themselves into paying more money for access to aviation that we already pay for as a taxpayer. I mean, it's the greatest act of deception I've ever seen foisted on anyone in the aviation industry is this That's concept of CASA. CASA way got of us to pay fees. twice. We're paying twice. But the real kicker comes for the fact that in creating this aberration, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority said to them, you can allow your members to fly Australian aircraft and they can self-certify their fitness to fly, meaning they don't have to go get a medical under the CASA system. They just say, I'm fit to fly. I'm, you know, I hold a private driver's licence, off I go. Now, this is a great standard, by the way, Senator, and it's safe. It's a great standard and it's safe. So much so, the US have done this and implemented it into their entire regulatory suite. The guys in the UK did this. UK CAA, Civil Aviation Administration in the UK, rolled it out into their regulatory suite. But in Australia, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority have refused to promulgate that safe medical standard so that all of the aviation industry can use it and they have restricted it so only their privatised monopoly provider can deliver it. Now, that's called third-line forcing. It's against the Trade Practices Act and if... CASA was not excluded under federal law, they would have been taken to court and had their asses sued for it. But there's an exclusion that allows them to, to be bypassed in that respect, and I think that legislation should change because it is third-line forcing. I don't know why, as an Australian citizen who holds a pilot's licence, why I have to be told by the Australian Commonwealth that I have to go pay a private company a fee to access a standard that the national safety regulator says is safe because under Australian legislation, the regulator is duty bound to promulgate what is safe into regulation and they're refusing to do it. 
And they have misled Senate inquiries and they have misled ministers and they have misled the Australian people and they continue to mislead the Australian people. So much so that right now we're going through a medical reform consultative phase. That's right. It takes the Australian safety regulator since 2017 to make a decision as to whether it will roll out a self-certification medical that the USFAA were able to get done in 12 months. The New Zealand guys got it done. The UK guys got it done. But in Australia, we can't get it done. Now, I often use the word corruption, and I love it when I use the word corruption because you, you say corruption to anyone at CASA, it's like fireworks going off. Oh, don't say that. And in fact, I had a meeting recently where I was highlighting what we, can, uh, what we were concerned with might have been corrupt actions of staff members and encouraging those investigations to take place. And the reaction I got for raising these concerns was astounding. It was almost like you're not allowed to tell us about it. And that in itself was deeply troubling. But you've got to ask yourself a question. Why is Australia's national safety regulator refusing to roll out a standard that it knows very well is safe? Why is it refusing to roll that standard out when it knows that by doing this, it's forcing people into a private business who holds a monopoly over the sector? Why is it refusing to do it knowing that by doing this, it's forcing pilots in the industry to have to pay a commercial fee to a private company? Why is it refusing to do it when it knows that its international peers have delivered it? And then after immense political pressure of the last five years, why is it now refusing to do it and saying it needs to go through further consultation in order to understand whether it can or it can't do it? And Senator, it's at this point that you start to then go deeper into it and you say to yourself, well, what does consultation mean to CASA? Well, when they say we want to consult on this medical standard, who do you think they consult with? They put together a working group and they invite a team of doctors who get paid by private pilots to do these complex CASA AVMED medicals that are at the very heart of the problem. And if that's not bad enough, they appoint the chief executive officer of that privatised aviation monopoly regulator to then sit on the technical working group as well. So we'll allow the CEO of the organisation who financially benefits from this discriminatory policy of CASA to refuse pilots with access to a safe medical standard to make decisions on behalf of pilots of which this individual has no bearing on. And we'll go and we'll ask doctors who gain a financial benefit from the system staying the status quo instead of involving IOPA and Sport Aircraft and all these other organisations who can sit there representing the very people that these policies imp uh, impact instead of having a meaningful consult on this and bringing in representatives from the United States and representatives from the UK and representatives from New Zealand, no, we'll stitch the industry up further and, and create this illusion that there is a reform taking place and an illusion that we're doing the right thing. And I think for the aviation industry, People have grown incredibly tired of this game. It is so transparent as to what is going on. It is crazy. They honestly believe that we as the Australian people don't see what's going on here. It is as plain as daylight that they are playing games and that they're being incredibly dishonest with what they're doing. Now, where does this relate to you as a senator? I've seen your Senate colleagues question the Civil Aviation Safety Authority on this issue for five years, Senator. And for five years, senators have said to CASA, we'd like you to publish to us your risk assessments and your data that underpins your refusal to promulgate this self-certification medical standard to private pilots in Australia. And CASA nods their head dutifully and gives a whole bunch of words. And they say, I oh, will take that on notice, Senator. And they never provide it. In the six years that I've been with AOPA, that I've been asking this question, I am yet to see CASA provide any data whatsoever that has supported their refusal and their continued policy that has actively discriminated private pilots in this country, they just can't produce a word. And Senator, and I'll hand it over to you because I really would love to know your view on this. To amplify the situation, 
Private pilots in Australia are regarded to have been trained to the highest possible standard for private aviation. CASA will tell you it maintains the highest possible training standards for private pilots in the world because safety is the most important thing to the aviation industry. And the aircraft largely that our private pilots are flying are what we call certified general aviation airplanes. These are airplanes that are built to the highest construction and certification standards in the world, which is, by the way, is a US standard. It's called FAR 23, Federal Aviation Regulation 23 certification. So we've got our most highest trained pilots in aircraft that are built to the highest safety standards and construction standards in the world. And CASA says the risk is too high to allow them to fly around self-certifying their medical fitness because they might have an accident. Now, for the privatised self-administration, they have pilots trained to the world's lowest standard, flying aircraft built to the world's lowest construction standards. And these aircraft in, in many cases now are faster than the certified general aviation airplanes. They are in many cases now becoming more complex than these general aviation certified airplanes. And CASA is telling us that those pilots trained to the lowest standards, flying around in aircraft built to the lowest standards in the world, with a passenger in the front seat with them, flying in the same airspace as the pilots on the CASA side, are the lowest risk, and that's why they're allowed to do it. Now, I have spoken with many professional risk assessment organisations and consultants, and I've asked them to do a professional risk assessment on this. And you know what every single one of them say? Why? It's obvious. The most experienced people flying the safest aeroplane are the lowest risk. So how is it in 2022, the Director of Aviation Safety in this country, Pip Spence, can look me in the eyes and can tell me she, she does not know how to make a decision on this issue and it has to go through consultation and that CASA needs to learn more about this subject. Senator, it, it, be, it defies logic that this situation goes on, but it typifies to me the, the challenge that faces us as an aviation industry at the hands of a regulator, that is unanswerable to any, they don't answer to anybody. Look, they don't provide I, 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 responses. They don't provide evidence for their decision-making. Ministers don't appear to be able to intervene on them. Major parties don't be, appear to be able to influence them. How do we change this? Well, you mentioned it last week in our, in our conversation, which I really enjoyed, I opened my eyes. Um, and my invitation stands, help us write, questions for Senate estimates. Now, we're supposed to get across so many topics. It's it's not possible for any one person to be an expert in everything. But I'll give you an example. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, okay? I was in southern Queensland in 2017, and I heard the Boulogne Shire Council, which is based on St. George, telling me about the, the terrible disruption and destruction of the Dirrambandi community, small town near the Queen, New South Wales border. So I went down there for a look and a listen, and the Murray-Darling Basin's plan is, is destroying that community, putting undue pressure on farmers, so much so that farmers are selling up, but completely mismanaged. So what I did was I said, okay, let's get the facts. So you'll notice that about me and about Pauline. So we went for a trip down the Murray-Darling Murray River, from well up in Victoria, listen to people in Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, right to the Murray Mouth. And we picked up solutions. We also got a better understanding of the problems. Now, I got knocked out of the Senate with dual citizenship. But when I came back in 2019, one of the first things I did was organise a fly around the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin to get a good feel for the topography. And I learned a hell of a lot from that. Then we went on the ground in northern New South Wales, southern Queensland. Then we went on the ground to the middle of the Murray-Darling Basin along the Murrumbidgee and up to Broken Hill. Then we went down the, the Murray again, Victoria, New South Wales, southern New South Wales, right down to, to uh, the Murray Mouth. Then we put in place a plan. Now, here's what here's, you, you, you tell me about Senate estimates questions and always putting things on notice and not delivering. We know that they're trying to hide things because they're embarrassed by their mismanagement of the Murray-Darling Basin. You're not going to extract stuff reliably by people who have got something to lose. So what we've done is we've very methodically and carefully, over a long strategy, asked questions within a very short 
um, what would you call it, range, right, of various topics. And when you ask questions, you ask them in a very sensible, direct, but very compact way. So there's no room for them to deviate and jump all over the place and give you bullshit. If they give you bullshit, you can then pick it up. You don't have to fight with them. Sometimes we do, but you don't have to fight with them there and then. You just come back next estimates and say, last estimate you said this. The facts are this. Can you explain yourself? And it's taken us nine trips to Senate estimate, but we've now got a Murray-Darling Basin plan we're about to release that is just phenomenal. It goes back to the basics. And so in the last Senate estimates last month, we asked the final question, final two questions, that put the final nails in the Murray-Darling Basin Authority's coffin. They And then we put a, put a, finished putting our plan together. But we've worked on that over the years. So what I'm saying to you is it, it requires a strategy for going after them by knowing where their weaknesses are and knowing where they can be exposed and then patiently going after them methodically so that they, when they make a mistake, you just, just round that up and use it next time. And so what I'm saying to you is uh, I, I need to be briefed. I, I don't make loose statements. I make statements based on fact and data. So I gather my data first, just like the Murray-Darling Basin Authority uh, and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. So my invitation to you is to, before the next Senate estimates, preferably sooner the better, that we have a long meeting together. You tell me in detail what is required. You give me uh, access to some other people who will give me perhaps a different view from you but I'll get the basics confirmed then. And then there's an open invitation for you to provide us with questions for Senate estimates. We'll tailor them to make sure that they're succinct because most people don't understand how, how brief they need to be. And then we'll put that into practice. So if, if you can brief me so that I understand your core problems, understand the solutions and understand who else to talk to because we love to get him, Paul and I listen like all over the place. We can get our facts together, get a feel for the situation, then we'll go after it. Otherwise, we're just playing games, pretending to ask questions and send estimates. We're not going to do that. We will ask questions that are based on solid data and solid facts and a solid understanding. Then we can help you. And then you can watch us in Senate estimates. You can tell us where they've where they bug it up. And then you can help us in the next Senate estimates to correct that, hold them accountable. Does that make sense? Look, I understand that process. The question I would have for you is on the issue where... Uh, CASA confirmed during an inquiry or a hearing uh, and they say that they will take it on notice and that they will supply uh, their documentation. What are the avenues that are available to follow that to follow that up and if they refuse to take action to compel that? Right. There's very little in the way of compelling unless we can get an understanding from the chair of the committee, which is also not very common not very often, that they have misled the Senate, that's one thing, or that they're withholding and not cooperating and that they're buggering us around. Um, we recently had the Therapeutic Goods Administration. We asked them for the process, to define the process, the guidelines, the restraints that require them to that go through when they assess a doctor's report of a, of a COVID injection uh, death that's, the, that's arisen from a COVID injection, and there have been plenty of them. They're not. They're not hidden. They're, they're hidden from the public at the moment. So, um, what we did was we asked for that process because they 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 changed from 800 and 811 deaths reported by doctors who have the authority to report uh, deaths, and they revised them down to just 11. 11 is still a lot, but that's what they revised them through to. So we asked them for their process. Next Senate estimates, we said. You had six weeks to do that. It's been four months. Where the hell is that data? Oh, we sent it to you. No, you did not. Then they implied they would send it straight away. They didn't. And then we we checked them again in the next Senate estimates, which was only about six weeks later. And we said, you haven't done it yet. So we then got, uh, we, we said to them again, you have not delivered. So we held them accountable. They said, well, we sent it. And the minister then checked. And the minister hadn't got back to us. But what we've since found is that they've given us an answer now, last week. That answer is completely hopeless. So now we've got something to stand stand them up over because they're basically just doing whatever they want to do, which sounds like what Cass is doing from your, from your anecdotes. So it depends on the circumstances, but you can hold them accountable. Even if nothing else, Ben, you can hold them accountable by embarrassing the hell out of them in public. They don't like that. 
So, uh, and then you can then you can write letters to the minister. There's many things you can do uh, to hold them accountable. What's got to happen is it's got to be persistent, persistent, persistent. You don't let the bastards go. You've got to hold them and you've got to be, have, have someone like yourself or, or a pilot or someone in general aviation to say, Malcolm, they just lied to you. Malcolm, they, they, this is the right answer. Next Senate estimates, we say, you said this, this is the reality. Isn't that true? And then they've got shit all over their face. So you've, well, just, got to, you've just got to approach it strategically and with determination. And you've just got to be persistent, 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 which is exactly the trait that Pauline has and I have. So we, we've got to do that. Well, tenacity and persistence is something I've got plenty of, and uh, I've made clear that it's got to be we, structured, though. It's got to be very are, targeted, uh, very, very strategic. Determined that we're going to get this uh, this discrimination ended, and that's really what it is, Senator. It, on the issue of the medical medical certification, it has been a wild discrimination that has impacted on thousands uh, of pilots across Australia because the dirty little secret that CASA doesn't like to tell the Commonwealth about is this that CASA will go out and CASA AVMED, their medical department, will ground a pilot and say, you're a risk to aviation safety and we're not allowing you to fly anymore. And that person goes straight out, sells their general aviation aeroplane, joins that privatised company, buys a recreational light sport aeroplane, converts their licence and off they go. And they stay flying in the aviation industry for many decades, perfectly safely, but they are now outside of the government system and... It is just wrong. It's wrong. Australia deserves an aviation regulatory yeah. framework that stands our country in good stead and one that enables our businesses to prosper and allows participants to take part without having to go pay private companies for the privilege of doing it. I'm an Australian citizen. You're an Australian citizen. Why should you have to pay a private company for you to access a medical certificate to fly in this country. It is an absurdity that's been foisted on the industry. It should never have happened. It's got to be righted. And I just think it's it's going to take some leadership from CAS. I'm really hoping that uh, well, DAS... I, I, don't, I don't think you'll get that from what the way you've described it. I'm going to have to go because I've got a, a commitment at 3 o'clock. Uh, but my invitation stands. If you can help us educate ourselves bring us up to up to speed with with these issues in depth so we understand them so we can hold them accountable then I'm willing to work through send estimates and whatever other methods we can we can pull Pauline and I come up with many creative methods but it's an invitation to you to to join with us and work educate us and then then guide us in implementing that strategy because this is bullshit it's been going on for decades so we've got to stop this well, Senator, I really do thank you for your time. I thank you for the opportunity to work with you. I am going to take you up on that offer and yep. AOPA will be doing everything that it can to support you in making these inquiries on our behalf. As I said at the outset, we, we, we don't support one party versus another, but we will support any politician that is working towards sensible, productive outcomes for aviation that ensures our members' rights uh, and can help stage the the aviation economy for some sustainability and success. So thank you very much. We'll definitely get you involved in some future broadcasts, no doubt. Uh, wish you all the best. Uh, as, More importantly, uh, get involved in Senate estimates with us. That, that's absolutely. where we can hold them accountable. And the other thing is we're happy to work with any politician who's telling the truth and is, and who is willing to speak up and has the courage to speak up. We're willing to work with any politician. We've got a track record, both of us, for doing that. We don't take on things to be political. We take on things in the national interest. So we're happy to work with you, happy to work with other politicians. Um, we've got a record of doing that. So, um, yeah, well, I'd love to get, with, get in touch. Uh, we've worked with Pauline on a number of issues. And Pauline, on behalf of our aviation industry, uh, has raised uh, matters in the past. And uh, we remain incredibly grateful for the work that she's been able to do in the One Nation team that have been involved in it. There's been a multitude of issues in Queensland that uh, the One Nation Party has worked with AOPA in resolving. And... Uh, we absolutely will continue to work with them. I often say that we need a strong caucus of willing politicians that would like to see a really successful aviation industry. And I think I'm getting the sense that you'd like to be part of that. So uh, yep. I'd like to work with you and make that happen. So thank you so much for your time today. We really do appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you for the invitation. We look forward to the next, next uh, session when we're actually working together to solve some of this bullshit. Thanks so much, mate. Take care. Well, there you go. That was Senator... <laughs> Malcolm Roberts does not disappoint and uh, what a great opportunity 
uh, to spend an hour and a half with him talking through aviation issues. Thank you to everybody as well that joined in during that discussion and putting your comments out there. I know sometimes these, uh, you know, these conversations, especially when we're we're just having a conversation about things that are impacting on the industry, can be a little bit dry to us in the industry where we're used to hearing about it. But this this is a process that I'm engaged in. Um, you know, just about every day of the week. You know, people often say, you know, why would I join AOPA? What does AOPA do? Well, this is what AOPA does. You know, we are there in the background every single day. We're working, we're having a conversation with elected officials, whether it's your council level or a state level or at a federal level. And as you can see, the politicians do want to have a conversation on aviation. It's not that they don't want to have a conversation. We just need to make sure that we're working hard, we're working tenaciously to get in front of them and to raise those issues. And so, uh, as I do at every point in time in this broadcast, but I'm going to just jump in before that. I'm going to put a slide up on screen. Uh, if you have not already heard about it, here it is, May Day. I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, quickly put a plug in for it. May Day this Sunday at the Bankstown Airport, uh, AOPA Australia Headquarters, which is the Falcon Air Facilities at Hangar 120, 15 stints in Crescent at Bankstown Airport. Come along and hear South Australian Senator Rex Patrick deliver a May Day address outlining his experience in the Senate, uh, his experience in dealing with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and what he is describing as a political sledgehammer that is required to bring about substantive and meaningful change. The Senator is coming all the way from South Australia to take part in this event. We warmly invite anyone from the aviation industry to come in and show your support. And this is a great opportunity for you to show your support. If you're out there and you want to see change in your aviation industry, if you want to see aviation thriving with thousands of new people getting involved and accesses to airport opening up and becoming more sustainable, then you need to get off your backside as well and come and support these people. These are your senators. They're your elected officials. They are in government speaking on your behalf. And I really do encourage you to come along, spend some time with them, get your message heard. You're more than welcome to meet the Senator on the day. We'll be delivering an impassioned uh, speech, no doubt. We'll be there along with the leadership uh, of another of a range of industry associations uh, and bodies uh, all taking part. So there is May Day. With me back on screen, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. And here it is. We want you to become a member of AOPA Australia. If you like what we do on your behalf and we do all of this for you, we don't do this for us. We're doing it for you. We want to see you have an aviation industry that is absolutely worth your while participating in, an industry that can support a multitude of aviation businesses, employing great people and providing an awesome future for young Australians. Uh, we want you to join and become part of the organisation. It's $159, guys, put a little bit of fuel in the tank of AOPA so that we can run these broadcasts, we can get out to all of these meetings and we can keep the advocacy going. I know one thing for certain, I'd really like some extra membership into the association so we can hire an assistant, someone who can work with me. I can't participate and do all of this stuff on my own. I need members right across the industry to come and take part so that we can really equip the organisation uh, to cope and to deal with the level and the magnitude uh, of the work that is uh, in front of us. And so a, a message there from Rodney Wallace. I think you've converted me. Ro welcome. <laughs> We're all born again at some point in time, Rodney. But guys, we really, I do mean what I say, we do this for you. It's all about our aviation industry. We actually care. We work with politicians on all sides of government. We're not aligned to one or the other. We will work with any Australian politician to build a powerful aviation caucus for change. And as you've you've heard delivered today, we are aware of the issues. We know what's going on. We know this needs to be changed and I am going to stay at this. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to walk away. I'm going to stay at this until we get these essential reforms delivered. And once we've got it done, I'll hand in the towel at that point in time. But until that point, uh, I am really, really honoured to be able to do this on behalf of our membership. It's a great opportunity for our members uh, to have their voice heard. And so get involved, aopa.com.au forward slash membership. And with that, Ladies and gentlemen and our supporters, I thank you very much for your time. I know it's uh, you're short on supply and precious, but I really do thank you for tuning in. And until next time, it's Ben Morgan from the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association of Australia.